let's consider the possible cases that we could encounter while doing a hypothesis test. So let's say for some magical reason we know, well, we don't need to say that we know this, but this is a possible case, right? Is the null hypothesis is true. And if the null hypothesis is too true, there are two things that can happen in the hypothesis test. Either we fail to reject it, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, or we reject the null hypothesis. Now, if the null hypothesis is true and we fail to reject it, this is the correct decision. This is the correct decision. In a perfect world, we would be making only the correct decision. But there are some, there is some wiggle room, potentially. In a hypothesis test, um, it is possible that you are unlikely or um, unlucky and you observe a statistical value that is extremely unlikely to occur, which might cause you to reject the null hypothesis even though it is true. This is an error. This is an error. And we call this type 1 error. This is referred to as type 1 error. Now, what if, in actuality, the null hypothesis is false? Then you want to be rejecting it, and this is the correct decision. If the null hypothesis is false, we would be rejecting it. So, there is another error that can happen, and that is that the null hypothesis is, in fact, false, but you fail to reject the null hypothesis. This is type 2 error. Type 2 error. All right, type 2 error. Uh, so, let's take a look at these a little more closely. Type 1 error, um, we tend to use the letter alpha to represent then the probability of committing a type 1 error. Probability of committing a type 1 error. Um, this is also referred to as the level of significance of the test. Level of significance. Level of significance. We tend to use the letter beta to talk about the probability of a type 2 error. Type 2 error. Beta. Probability of failing to reject H not when it in fact is false. The complement of this 1 minus beta is called the power of the test. power of the test. It's called the power of the test. So what's the power of the test? This is often something we are concerned with is rather than just the probability of committing a type 2 error, but we might say, what is the power of the test, right? What is this probability? The power of the test, this is the complement of committing a type 2 error. That is actually, you know, the probability of getting that correct decision. This is the probability that you reject the null hypothesis given the null hypothesis is in fact false. Given the null hypothesis is in fact false. So these are the possible in our two-way table. Either the null hypothesis hypothesis is true or false. Okay. Um, and so oftentimes what a statistician will, will do is set up the level of significance first, and you actually want to do this before you um, proceed with your test, and decide, you know, how much type error are you willing to accept? Um, we, can, we can control that. And once that's determined, right, um, if we're not willing to accept much type 1 error, that's fine. Um, we, can, we can control that. Uh, and so what I want to do is take a look at an example where we get to talk a little bit about the actual likelihood of committing some of these errors and computing some of these probabilities. So I will scroll way down here, where I have this first example set up. 
A type of cold vaccine is known to be only 25% effective after a period of two years. We want to know if a new vaccine is better. So we apply the new vaccine to 20 individuals and record X. X is counting the number of individuals for which the new vaccine still works after two years. So let's define the null hypothesis to be the two vaccines are equally useful. The two vaccines would be equally useful. And the alternative hypothesis is that the new vaccine is better. All right, so what does this actually mean when we say the two vaccines are equally useful? Well, the original vaccine was 25% effective after a period of two years. So if the two vaccines are equal, then the probability for the new vaccine should be 25% success after two years, should be 25% for the new vaccine. What would be the alternative? The new vaccine is better. If the new vaccine is better, then we would interpret that where P is greater than 25%. We want it to work for more than more than 25% after two years. So our null hypothesis is that the probability is equal 25%. The alternative is that it is greater than 25%. So let's suppose that we will reject the null hypothesis if X is greater than eight. We tested on 20 individuals and decided that we will reject the null hypothesis if more than eight individuals um, still, uh, the vaccine is still working for them after two years. Let's find alpha, the probability of a type one error with these conditions. Let's find alpha, the probability of type one error given these conditions. So what is alpha? That is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis given that it is true, even though H naught is true. This is then the probability of, so what do we reject it? We reject it when X is greater than eight. That's the probability that X is greater than eight when P is equal to 0.25. That is the probability that X is greater than eight when P is equal to 0.25. Well, if we assume, if we assume that P is 0.25 and we want the probability that X is greater than eight, think about how do we, what's the likelihood that the vaccine works for any individual? These individual probabilities are binomial. We have 20 individuals, so there's 20 trials and a success, the assumption is the success rate is 25%. We want to know then what's the probability that uh, type one error, that would be computing the sum of these as we go from nine to 20, nine to 20, right? Um, right. This is, this would be the probability that X is greater than or equal to nine when it is binomial with n equals 20 and p equals 0.25. This is exactly what we want. So how do we figure out the probability that x is greater than or equal to nine? Well, this is binomial, right? And so we can go ahead and take a look at the table here. Um, how would one compute this probability from nine to 20? There's a couple ways that you could do this. Um, one might consider the complement that would be the probability that X is less than or equal to eight. Well, that's the complement. So we would want one minus that one minus the probability that X is less than or equal to eight. Uh, the point of this is not necessarily to practice our binomial probabilities. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, let's go see if we can find the table when N is 20 and P is a quarter. Do we have that ready to go here? I, I do not. So let me pull up my table. Go ahead and take a look in the back of your book. Uh, do, do, do. And here we go. Where's our binomial table? Poisson, Poisson, binomial, n is 20, p is 0.25, and we're looking at a complement of less than or equal to 8. That's 0.9591. 0.9591. 
five nine one is the probability that I'm pulling right there. And so the probability of committing a type one error then is 0 0.0409 or about 4.09%. About 4% is what we've done, what we've decided there. That is our type one error, okay? There are a couple ways this actually can happen in practice. On In, in, in one sense, someone can set the significance level to be like 4%. And then you can go backwards and say, well, what is the equivalent X value that would do that, right? Um, or, you know, someone could set this, you know, significance level and say, we're willing to accept a type one error of 5%. So what is the X value that would uh, allow us a type one error of 5% and kind of try to reverse engineer that, right? Um, and that's common, right? Uh, which can you know can be done by by looking looking at the table there um, when you know n is 20 or we can specify the number of individuals that we are willing to accept as well that is our alpha our type 1 error what about what about the type 2 stuff remember type 2 error is the probability that you fail to reject h naught even though it is false even though it is false all right so this is this is a little more interesting. If we want to find beta, if we want, if we want to find beta, we need to look at a specific alternative hypothesis. Look at a specific alternative, alternative hypothesis. Let me look at a specific alternative hypothesis, right? So what's a valid alternative hypothesis? Any p-value greater than 25% can work, right? But we can't compute any of these probabilities unless we have a specific value for p. So let's say we look at the specific alternative hypo hypothesis that the probability, the true probability of success is 50%, right? Then we can calculate beta the probability of a type two error. In this case, in this case, if P is 50%, type two error, type two error, right? Type two error is the probability that you fail to reject given it's false. So we fail to reject, which would mean X is less than or equal to eight. Given it's false, we fail to reject a null hypothesis when when p equals 50%. When p equals 50%. And that we can calculate. This is the sum as x goes from 0 to 8 of our binomial tests with 20 and a success probability now of a half. And we can look that up in the tables and we should quickly find that that is 2.517. Okay. This type 2 error beta will change depending on what the specific alternative hypothesis is, right? If I say, um, what is the type 2 error when the alternative is 40%, I'm going to get a different value for beta, right? I'm going to get a different value for beta, right? So this is one of the reasons why we bring up the word power in the test, right? The power of the test How do we interpret the power of the test? Remember, the power of the test is one minus this. The power of the test then would be 74.93%. That's one minus 25.17%. This is the power of the test, 74.93%. So what do, how do we interpret that, right? This is a success. This is the probability that we make a correct decision. The test will properly reject, the test will properly reject, reject the null hypothesis that the success probability is 25%. It'll properly reject it about 75% of the time. 
of the time. Of the time. If, if, if the true, if the true value is 50%. Right? If the true value is 50%, then we will properly reject the null hypothesis about 75% of the time. Okay? And that's how we can interpret that. That's how we can interpret that. All right? Um, and so in terms of power, right, that's not very powerful, right? Ideally, you'd want a test that has a, um, l a very low type 1 error, and you'd want one that's very powerful for potential likely cases, right? 50% is much different than 25%. I would ideally want a more powerful test that would properly reject it, you know, maybe 90% or 95% of the time, right? And that can sort of help guide what you might be thinking about as for your level of significance. There's a little bit of um, pull, tug and pull here, some interplay there, okay? And so maybe we want a more rigorous test, right? Maybe we want to change our value, our cutoff value here. Maybe we don't reject the null hypothesis if x is greater than 8. Maybe we see what happens as we change that. And you can, you can um, you know, set these percentages uh, maybe where you want them based on that. That is going to do it for this video outlining um, how to calculate some of these errors. Okay. In future videos, as you get further into this, You'll talk about actually computing uh, or actually doing hypothesis tests, but when you do in a hypothesis test, right, these these constraints, the type one error, right, the level of significance, is always determined before you run the test. You have to set these before you run the test. You can't run the test and then start choosing your errors. You need to set these before, and so it's good to get a feel of how to calculate the power of a test and the level of significance of a test as well. We'll see you in future videos.